Hello everyone. In this professional development video, we'll be discussing present levels of academic achievement and functional performance, which is also known as a PLATH. My name is Brent Elder, and I'm an assistant professor of interdisciplinary and inclusive education at Rowan University. On this professional development video agenda, we'll be discussing an overview of strength-based language when writing IEPs or discussing students with disability labels. We'll be discussing a tool called Fast Facts, and we'll also be discussing directly how to write PLAFs with some examples. So an overview of strength-based approaches. Um, in this example, uh, I'm gonna first talk about a deficit-based example and then a strength-based example. And this comes out of an article I wrote with two different colleagues. And in this deficit-based approach to describing students with disability labels, this one says, Franklin is a second grade student who has labels of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, and an intellectual disability. Franklin often has difficulty staying on task and focused. He also has a hard time comprehending and recalling material. Currently, Franklin is on grade level for math, but is well below grade level in reading. Specifically, Franklin has a hard time comprehending and recalling information read from a text. Because of these difficulties, Franklin is often unable to recall information from both independent reading books and books read aloud. So I often come across present levels of academic performance written in this way, where it talks about students as kind of a sum of their labels. And it tells me a lot of what he can't do, or you know, if things are written in this way, it doesn't really communicate much information. Um, and so I want to call out a few examples of that here. First, I often see an, an overfocus on labels, which are subjective and oftentimes applied to students um, and aren't very descriptive what students can do and what their cap what their strengths are. Here, Franklin has ADHD and a label of intellectual disability. Um, oftentimes labels are used to justify segregation or removal from a general education setting. So in this example, they say things like, he has difficulty staying on task. He's well below grade level in reading, but what can he do in reading? Um, and what supports does the teacher provide Franklin so that he is successful? The point of writing PLAFs is so we provide information to share with other professionals um, who are, are part of the IEP team so that everyone is on the same page with what to do, not just talking about what Franklin can't do. And again, uh, here, Franklin is unable to recall information from independent reading books um, and books read aloud. It doesn't tell me very much. It, I can presume that he needs support with reading, but I don't really know what to do. In this other example, again, this is an excerpt from this article above. Franklin is a friendly young boy who enjoys trains and tall buildings. Franklin is timid in new situations, but warms up quickly to people. He is a hardworking second grade student who enjoys attending school, working with his teachers and developing relationships with his peers. He enjoys and excels in math. During math instruction, he likes to use manipulatives when working to solve a given problem. Currently, Franklin is working at mastering double digit addition problems. When given 10 double digit addition problems, Franklin gets an average of six correct. However, when given assistance, such as the teacher drawing the line between the two digit number, Franklin is able to solve them correctly most of the time, as long as there are no carryovers. Franklin has labels of intellectual disability and ADHD that affect him academically because it is more difficult for him to comprehend and remember material. And his label of ADHD makes it harder for him to stay on task and focus for the duration of a lesson. So clearly there's differences in how this is written here. First, we're starting with strengths and what he's into. He's more than just a sum of his disability labels. So, and if, if we know what Franklin is into, we know how to motivate him in, in class and infuse trains and tall buildings into content so that he's gonna be more naturally interested. 
when we're talking about subject areas. So during math instruction, we have an idea now of what to give him in order to be successful. He, he's successful with manipulatives. Um, it also is very specific about the average of uh, problems he gets correct when given assistance, such as a teacher drawing a line between the two digit number. So again, the onus is on the teacher to support Franklin. And it's very clear, if I were a substitute teacher in this class, I'd have a very clear idea on what Franklin needs to be successful. Um, and another thing to think about here is um, he does have labels of intellectual disability and ADHD. Um, and so we're not saying that he doesn't need support, um, but we are saying that um, in order for him to stay focused, um, you know, we, we provide these, these supports academically. So what significant differences in language and student support do you notice in each? As I just mentioned, in the second example, the strength-based example, we're clear on the types of supports that Franklin requires to be successful. If Franklin was a student in your class, what kinds of expectations would you have for him? Typically, if we use a deficit-based approach to describing students, we view them more negatively and we have lower expectations. So strength-based approaches promote high expectations and student success. How would your understanding of Franklin in each situation affect how you would approach teaching him? If you received negative or deficit-based descriptions of students, it makes you more apprehensive because you don't feel like you have an understanding of what to do. And a strength-based approach flips that and does give you some tools, at least to start to get to know the students um, so that you have a higher chance of success and so do they. And what influences do you think the two approaches have on the lives of the respective students and their families? Oftentimes, parents are hit with deficit-based descriptions of their children with disabilities. And that disenchants them with the collaborative process. And oftentimes, that leads to um, parents being detached from the IEP collaborative process. And so if we consciously shift our language into something more respectful and strength-based, parents oftentimes feel more willing to collaborate and open up um, and are um, willing to collaborate um, in a bit different way. And I want you to be thinking about what scenario best represents your experience at your school site. Um, unfortunately, my experiences um, as a former special ed teacher and as, a, as someone who works in a lot of schools, um, my experience is the deficit-based approach by far outweighs the strength-based approaches that I see. So I wanna provide you with tools um, to think about things differently and to do things differently. Um, this is an example of uh, a tool called Fast Facts, and this is actually from a former student of mine, and this is hyperlinked here, and you'll be provided with that um, as a way to access this if it's something you're interested in using. Um, so this student here um, is, um, we start with the motivators at the very top here. Um, so he's really flexible most of the time. Um, he attaches to people. Um, he, he benefits most from visual cues, um, showing him pictures of things and people that he knows is really helpful for him. He has a very supportive family. Um, another thing to note at the very top of this uh, fast facts is um, the teacher. So you, you, know, the, you have the teacher's name and the room number. Oftentimes you might have a sub aide or a paraprofessional who comes in at the last minute um, and they don't know where they're going. They don't know when their breaks are. And so I always had this as a way to communicate a lot of information in a short period of time. Um, so then again, we have student strengths on the left and the student needs. We're not, we're not glossing over the needs, but we are also focusing on the things that the students are good at. In this case, the student is happy, flexible, uses visuals, um, has lots of friends, uses an iPod touch to communicate. This was a few years ago. Um, and the things that he needs to be successful, he needs to copy letters from a highlighted sample. He needs to use a communication device. Uh, he needs clear goals like first do something and then you get a break or a book or computer. Um, and you notice here with the abilities here, 
it's across subject areas. So the things that the student can do in reading, in writing, in math, spelling, and so on. And the second page of this, which isn't on this slide, um, communicates what he does in specials like the computer lab, the library, um, things like that. And so that when someone, you know, a special area teacher or a new teacher in the next school year receives this information, they go, oh, I have a lot to work with here. Um, and so if this is a format that you like, um, you have, I've provided a link to a template. It's a Word doc if that is something you're comfortable working with. So I wanna provide another um, example here. Um, Michael is in sixth grade. He has good verbal skills and can count objects up to 30. He knows the first 15 language arts Dolch sight words and loves to look at books with colorful pictures. He is a tactile and visual learner. He likes to work in small groups. He has a label of intellectual disability and screams at and hits others when frustrated. He can be extremely disruptive in class. So I would say this is a bit better than the deficit-based example we started this with, um, but this can still use some work. Some things that I call attention to here are, uh, he has good verbal skills, okay. Um, but what specifically is he good at? Give me a little bit more. I would like to see that uh, unpacked a little bit more. Um, and clearly, you know, he screams and hits others. While probably important knowledge to know what promotes him to stay calm and to not hit others. Um, and what promotes um, his success in class uh, when he's getting frustrated. So, um, and, and when is, when he is disruptive in class, what do we do about it? Or how do we stop this from happening? And so here's an example. Michael is in sixth grade and loves video games and hanging out with his neighbors. His parent describes him as very social and always talking. He can count objects up to 30 and he benefits from the use of a calculator when completing double digit addition and subtraction problems that require regrouping. He knows the first 15 language arts Dolch sight words and loves to look at books with colorful pictures. He is working on matching pictures to words that are on his weekly spelling list. He is a tactile and visual learner. He likes to work in small groups. He has a label of intellectual disability and can work with built-in breaks every 20 to 30 minutes. If he is not reminded of upcoming breaks, he sometimes screams at the teacher and can attempt to hit others when frustrated. A clear picture schedule helps keep Michael focused and engaged in class. So it unpacks this in a different way. And I want to call your attention to, you know, always starting with strengths and, um, you know, communicating the things that students like. Um, here, I have a fighting chance if I'm going to modify and infuse some of Michael's interests into the curriculum. I'll start with, you know, infusing pictures of video games or asking his parents about getting pictures of his neighbors so we can infuse them into things that we do like stories or journals and stuff like that in class. Um, and then again, infusing in here what teachers can do uh, in order to support and promote student success. And in this case, it's a calculator when doing double digit addition and subtraction problems that don't require regrouping. And then again, I wanted to give an example about, um, sure, he knows 15 Dolch uh, sight words, but how are we expanding that um, and building those skills? And in this case, Michael is matching pictures to words that are on the spelling list because that is a valid form of literacy that we're going to build up over time. And we want to acknowledge that sometimes Michael struggles in class. And if he's not reminded of changes or his breaks, he can get frustrated and hit other students, which we want to avoid. But we want to provide some structure and some ideas here about how to do that. So if you wanted to take a deeper dive into these concepts, um, you can read about more strength-based language uh, and PLAFs in pages 122 through 123 and pages 132 to 134 in the article I've referenced and linked here. This is the article reference and it's free to download. And I wanna thank the LRC South for providing um, me the opportunity to do this professional development video.